the technology thing and the deadlines that we provide, and sometimes we overlay it with a real life scenario, something maybe I've seen in a war zone or a disaster zone, adds that stress and uncomfort that is so critical to figuring out how to optimize your team because trust falls and all that crap isn't going to really do it for you. You got to get the stress. Welcome to the Start of Defense. My name is Callie Keen. Today I have Brad Hazley of Building Momentum. Brad, welcome to the show. Can you give us a little bit of your background? What's the story of Brad? What's the story of Building Momentum? And I ask this of everybody, what are you passionate about right now? Well, thanks for having me. This is awesome to be on your show. I'm excited to to talk about it. I think what I'm passionate about now will come out in a little bit of the backstory. So I was a former Navy officer, was a diver, went, became a SWO, and then hurt my shoulder and got processed out of the military due to a, like a, a botched surgery. So I was trying to figure out what to do next, and I went to a think tank uh, at Stanford Research Institute and became... I'm a scientist there and doing DARPA, you know, agency related technology is at very fundamental R&D levels. Really loved doing that, but got frustrated that none of that tech was going anywhere, sort of straight out of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they roll the cool tech you just made into a warehouse and call it a day. Um, At the same time, you know, uh, we were pretty much knee deep in Iraq and Afghanistan. Some of my friends were out there calling me and saying, you got the smartest people in in the universe all around you. And yet we can't get basic robotics. We can't get basic ISR. We can't get, you know, any of this stuff. So it kind of haunted me enough to where I finally left SRI, found a consulting company that had a contract with the army and immediately went down range in 2008 to see what was going on. What was the deal? I had a lab in Baghdad, but just pushed out all around the country on missions as much as I could to sort of see what the heck was going on. And I spent about a year there building tech, prototyping things. And at the end of that, uh, at that time, the Army wanted more of that. And so I started training nerds, mostly PhDs, to go to, to war. And in that, developed this insane sort of training process where it was like hell week of tech. So they had to build something. They would learn a 3D printer. They had to build something. They would, they would weld. They'd have to build something. You know, very purpose-driven technology development. And I fell in love with that too. So when I started building momentum, I wanted to do both. I wanted to go to fun places of the world and do sort of the in-situ prototyping and problem solving, and then teach people how to do that. So that was uh, that was a lot of fun. That's where the company started. So then about passion, it is truly around helping people when they're at their worst, whether in a disaster zone, I was in Ukraine in the fall, trying to help out over there, um, or you know, war zones, disaster zones, but even in the community. We work with severely underserved or, or people in systemic poverty around here in Northern Virginia. And that's what I'm passionate about, just helping humans, especially those that need it the most. I was really excited for this conversation because your background really encapsulates some major themes that we have on the show, seeing and solving real problems in the situation, empowering people with the tools that are commercially available and kind of the speed of commercialized process, but for really high value applications. So I I like that you went for the historically disadvantaged, what we can do in our community, because I really think that DOD or IC experiences these problems at a very high level. But when we solve for a high value proposition in one area, that it's immediately transportable to other areas that are of equal value or of much larger scale. And that, that leads to this dual use conversation. And I want you to introduce everyone to building momentum and the garden and kind of what you're doing in our Northern Virginia community. Because you can kind of see this as like it's giving accessible training and tools to innovators, but you're also serving people in the DoD as well and kind of mashing everybody together with an event space. And we've had events there and brought in adventures and entrepreneurs. And you're getting at that triple helix of innovation where you get government and universities and, you know, innovator and people all together. So can you give us a little bit more like brass tacks about the space and the kind of things that happen there? You know, what what bubbles up there at Building Momentum? Yeah, you said that really well, the sort of helical uh, imagery that you gave was fantastic. And I, you know, a lot of what we've been doing was very evidence when I was in Kiev about like the community helping the warfighters. So I really, 
I do truly believe that all of these things um, overlay. But yeah, so Building Momentum and the Garden, I own the, both of them, but I've, I'm a terrible marketer. And so the idea was that initially the Garden would be this like event space that was kind of running independent of Building Momentum. Building Momentum was this prototyping and, and training team. And it turns out they are completely intertwined as well. So uh, we have a facility here in Alexandria that does all sorts of things, but they're all, again, centric around problem solving. So I have an event space that holds you know, a couple hundred people with everything from microphones and stages to a bar and, and all the accoutrements around hosting events like that. And we've done, you know, we do weddings and we do uh, parties, but we also do things like TED Talks and symposiums and things where we're trying to do problem solving. You know, you, frankly, you think about even a wedding, it's like someone needs a venue and, uh, you're, and you're helping them solve that problem. But it's more of those human intersections that I found are so important in the innovation space. And then sort of around that place, I have two different facilities, one that's very adjacent to the event space, which is a giant workshop that has welders and, and uh, 3D printers and laser cutters and woodworking equipment. And that has become more of a training lab for us. And then two doors down, I have a sort of a higher end machine shop with uh, CNC mills and metal 3D printers and you know CNC plasma cutters. Um, and it's also where our electronics and drone team work. And that's where we do a lot of our interesting training for some of our, you know, SOCOM friends or special operations friends and conventional forces uh, we do down there. But even this week, we're doing some really interesting stuff uh, with some some ODA groups down there and, and teaching them sort of uh, nascent and emerging technologies. It is a weird space. And uh, in any given day, I was walking from one end to the other, you know, about six months ago. We were building these like mobile labs for uh, for the Australians in one of the rooms. SEAL team was was getting trained in another room. I come down here. There, we had been hosting some uh, some of the chaplains in the military. They were discussing suicide prevention. Keep going. There's a kids program going on in the workshop and an Indian wedding going on in the event space. And I was like, and see, we nailed it. Uh, the most sort of diverse population sets around. But that's what we do. And then our business areas are really around four pillars. And it's just kind of the same thing. We have innovation boot camp, which is our sort of technology training for the DOD and also for industry. We do Innovation Elevated, which is our corporate training side. So this is, you're still building things, making things, but it's lensed a little bit more to inter, interpersonal dynamics and management dynamics. But you're still going to be welding or 3D printing or flying a drone or doing something because technology is that amazing backdrop where you're, you're feeling uncomfortable. And in those moments, all those little sort of predilections for poor or good management come out. And then uh, we have Innovation Academy, which is where we're teaching kids. I mean, kind of the same thing, problem solving with tech. So they're, I mean, I taught my seven-year-old daughter how to weld. So the, you know, it's, it's very approachable. And then lastly, we do uh, something we call innovation design. So if you want that really weird thing built, we're great at that. If you want, you know, a hundred of a very standard thing built, I'm not super interested in that. But if you want that weird, unique Thing that no one's ever done before and you need it fast, that's kind of our wheelhouse. I can see that really supporting a lot of the you know, national lab teams, but of course the SOCOM teams. You gain so much actual experience and knowledge on the execution side once you understand the context of how things work and how they're made. I think that a lot of people I see retire out of the service, they have this built up catalog that any commercial company would value at millions or billions of dollars of these problems. Like I understand the pure context of these issues that we have because of this very specific situation. This is something why current technology doesn't work, but this is why a commercial product would really solve that problem if I could just X, Y, Z it. You know, I could tape it together solder it together, put it in a better housing often is the kind of, you know, make it a little bit more portable, but without the context of, well, how does that work? Like how does an Arduino work? How does soldering work? What are the possibilities on execution? All those problems just kind of lay fallow. They lack value. Whereas in the commercial area, it's all the opposite. We have all the execution capabilities in the world, but very little context on the actual problems. So empowering either of those sides, you're in a great place. The problem set is what I really enjoy. And I think that's one of the things that is taken for granted. There's so many times we develop solutions based on sort of the incomplete picture of the problem. And I'm actually not a huge technology honk. Like I use technology to solve a problem. And I, so I'm not going to 
herald 3D printing being the panacea of all things DOD or logistics. To me, everything is just a different flavor of hammer. That's fine. I'll learn it. I'll learn whatever the cutting edge is. Quantum computing, great. Give me one of those. If it solves my problem, that's great. If not, it just goes onto the shelf. But it's, it's really identifying what the problems are. And so a great example recently is, you know, we set up this other facility in, um, in one, like I said, one of the poorest areas of Virginia. And the idea is we were going to start using um, some of the problems in the community to teach carpentry, teach 3D printing, teach uh, electronics. And it's really interesting the things that you tease out of that situation because you have to meet people where they're at, right? And so just blowing in there and being like, I got you, we're going to solve all these problems. There's a lot of distrust in the community that way. They don't know me. So it's really getting into the problem set itself, which in most cases, if I feel like, boils down to human to human interaction. Even in like the most technologically advanced, whatever, whatever, when you distill it all down, it's really just working with humans every day and figuring out what their problems are. And then just sort of launching from that. I really like the problem solving curation process. I really like something you said a little while back about the management principles or the management tactics, like in process of a project, because the stress of actually doing a thing, right? Doing a project under a deadline kind of reveals maybe less desirable characteristics or our, our weaknesses or our strengths. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I, I think that in and of itself, I'm thinking, Man, that is super smart what Brad just said, because even if you had a team of technologists and you said you have an hour to do this, where you you see the artist is like, hey, sketch out Spider-Man in 15 seconds, in five minutes, and in an hour. When we have those deeper constraints, it reveals a lot. It's like taking the water out of the harbor. You see the all the rocks in the path. I wonder if you have any fun stories that you can share about that. But if you could expand on it a little bit more, I'm kind of curious because it's so smart. What you just kind of glossed over it. I, I like your metaphor again about the uh, about the rocks being exposed. Uh, that's a good one. That's exactly what this is. So I've seen this too many, and I got I do have an anecdote for you. But I've seen this too many times where like there's a team and there's an obvious asshole in the group or several assholes in the group. And in a team building situation, like they're on their best behavior there. Everyone's like, it's kind of newish, but it's predictable what the outcomes are going to be. And so you can get away with, you know, not letting your true inner jerk self come out and, and all those little cracks and fissures within that team. When you put even, even PhD, mechanical, aerospace, whatever, you put someone into a technology situation where they have to build something under a deadline, all of that is laid bare. So one of the great examples we had a couple of years ago, there was an organization that it, it was the, it's a organization from the government. So I'll just leave it at that right now. But they had a, um, a really senior team come in and then the head of that, the entire organization was there. And I pulled that person aside and was like, look, you need to not take over. Like your team is going to look for you to take over. You're the boss. You're just going to have to like, you know, facilitate so they can get something out of this experience as well. And they had to build and it was an aggressive day. So in one day, one t one side of the team had to build a slot car out of you know wood. They had to solder up um, the the motors. They had to make all the contactors. The other team had to weld up a water wheel that it was a, that was attached to a generator. And so the idea was that at the end of the day, rain water over the water wheel. The water wheel would turn. The generator would power the track, and the car would go around the track. That everything was hand built. And then the team that got most laps for fifty five gallons of water would win. You know, one hour into this, they were having some issues. This one part of the team was having some issues without even like instantaneously, without even acknowledging our conversation. This guy just goes and takes over and gets in, goes into this rabbit hole and just starts because he had an engineering background even before he became the head of his organization and was just like driving the ship, driving the ship. And what ended up happening is it fractured the team, just like you would think. And when it came to that integration side between the water wheel and the, and the car, since no one was talking and this person was just heads down building and sort of taking over the whole situation, they missed a very important part of the integration and they got blown away by the other team. The other team had a bunch of very senior people, generals and, and things like that as well. But one of the generals had made a, a point to just communicate everything and just communicate and communicate. And communicate. So uh, at the end, we were like, is this representative of what you see in the workplace? And everyone was super sheepish to bring that up. And so I just started really poking people in the eye and being like, I saw this behavior. Is this what it's like in the office? And eventually like, yeah, it's kind of what's going on. And I said, great. Well, that's great. It's okay. That's fine. Let's, no, let's get that out and talk about it. And let's think of strategies that go beyond this. But what ends up happening in a lot of these team buildings is you never get to that, like that raw authenticity of what, 
is actually happening and why. And so if you start peeling that onion, why did that guy take over? Well, we were under the gun and it was urgent and I didn't, you know, I didn't trust the team to do all the things I know how to do because I'm an engineer. Now you're starting to see some of these issues, right? You need to trust the team, even when it's an urgent, you know, deadline, you have to, you have to let go and let that trust happen. So the, the technology thing and the deadlines that we provide, and sometimes we overlay it with a real life scenario, something maybe I've seen in a war zone or a disaster zone, adds that stress and uncomfort that is so critical to figuring out how to optimize your team because trust falls and all that crap isn't going to really do it for you. You got to get the stress. I love that. We go to war with the team that we have too. So you can't just as a you see as a toxic management trait, it's like, oh, I would just have, you know, I'd have more engineers on my team. I'd have a better team or I'd do this and I'd do that. Well, that's kind of your responsibility right now. You're not really taking ownership of the fact that this is the team that you have. You're not leveling them up. That's why you're here is to level them up. And so they're not getting leveled up because you're not letting them even participate in the training exercise that you're here to help facilitate their growth, right? Yeah, we go to war. We do a project with the team that we have. And I I think that's fascinating because I've done I've done enough startup weekends, hackathons. So I've conducted some corporate training, some large local companies as well. And you definitely see this as like really smart people. They've been trained how the organization works and they're looking for someone to more like from the head down authoritatively delegate a small role to them. Well, why aren't you drawing up this possible solution? We have all these printers here. You can just do whatever you want. You're just waiting and doing nothing, they're like, well, you know, I don't know if it's going to be a good idea. We all kind of don't know it's going to be a good idea. That's the whole point is it costs me two cents and 30 minutes of printing to try something out. So let's try five things. They'll probably all be bad, but the second round of the two that we select will be pretty good. But if you're waiting for XYZ, you know, head honcho dude to say that you have a good idea, guy doesn't know either. So it's kind of a waste of time. It's going to take forever to get to the 10 iterations we need to create some kind of new innovation. Yeah, we had an exact example of that not too long ago where the Navy approached us and said, you know, hey, Brad, can you make us a gimbal for 3D printers on ships? And I was like, do you need it active? Do you need it passive? And they're like, we don't know. And I said, you don't know you need a gimbal is what I'm hearing. So I I said, give me a, give me a, you know, give me a minute. So we went out and built this. You can see it on our on our YouTube channel. This whole large, I mean, it's probably like eight feet by ten feet system that you put a three D printer on, and it simulates a ship. It simulates the heaving and, and rolling and yawing of a ship. We actually add thumpers on there, so it, it feels like you know aircraft landing on an aircraft carrier. And you, we can dial this thing up. And by the way, we made it out of like garage door opener parts and an Arduino. And we had some high school kids help us. And we did it in a few weeks for a few thousand bucks. And we mocked this whole thing up and we ran a bunch of 3D printers on it. And actually some some industry 3D printer makers heard about what we were doing and just sent us theirs for free just to like beat on it. And the result was you probably don't have a problem actually. If it's C state like nine and you're in a frigate or eight or something, you're throwing up like I used to do, go hit pause on the printer and throw up. If it's a nice day, print. Like this isn't rocket science. Like you don't need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a gimbal. Like don't, what are you doing? And so that's that was the feedback we gave the Navy, which is just don't worry about it. And then actually t- two days ago, I got another call that the Marine Corps is thinking about putting these other printers on ships. And they asked for the same information again. I was like, here's our report, go read it. Don't invest in gimbals, you know, just hit pause. And it's that sort of that realism where people are overthinking it, they're overthinking it. And it's like, I'll be right back. And I just mock it up really fast and, 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 you know, make some, make some intellectual headway in that space. I just think that's something that isn't done enough. I was at think tanks. Like I know this, we, everyone loves to, you know, postulate and sermonize. And it's like, well, if we just run out and get our elbows dirty really quick, we can probably make a lot of intellectual headway here. Anyway, that's, that's kind of who we are. I like that. I mean, for that specific example, the normal industry approach would be to pay an engineering company to come up with a test fixture, do a ton of analysis on the test fixture itself, do a requirements report. So now you're into the tens of thousands, if not exceeding $100,000, then build the thing, test that thing, and then do like an industry survey for all the different printers and do this and this and this. When in reality, is like, 
you could just build it and try it. It was like six thousand dollars of stuff, by the way, and we did it literally like in four weeks with two high school interns. You can't beat how smart high school interns are getting, though. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. And this is an analogy that I give to a lot of, uh, you know, I think we have a lot of uh, common friends and people like this. I say, look, you have to look at what smart teenagers are doing in their free time on the weekends, right? If you want to be ahead of every single possible innovation and curve, like just look, look at what a 15, 16 year old is doing on their own time. Look at what they're putting in their race car. Look at what printer and what they're printing. You're going to see, you're going to jump two years of the big boys innovation by just looking at what, what kids are doing for, uh, for free. Cause like, uh, a lot of the projects that we end up working on, I, I tell them, Hey, you know that there's an open source, you know, I can just download this, this code. Computer vision is a good example or different, uh, AI things. People come in there obsessed with this and I tell them, Hey, I can just get you a small form factor computer. We can just push some open source code to it and try it in like a couple of weeks or a month if you really want, and then figure out why does this not work? Yeah. I saw that firsthand that Actually, in Kiev, because I uh, I sat down with one of the drone builders there, got a chance to meet. He and he's posted a bunch of stuff on on YouTube, and you, you can probably hunt his stuff down. So I was talking to him about like how we got started, and you know what possibly we could do to help. He gives me all this drone story stuff about how he he was a marketing guy, and then used YouTube and GitHub, and then so I was really fascinated by that because the drone world, you know, is very sort of that way. Then he starts segueing into software defined radios. And we had been just recently teaching um, JSOC how to do these, to use these things for some sort of, sort of uh, SIGINT type of applications and MILDEC applications, but also listening and things like that. And he was like only one or two steps behind me just using GitHub and YouTube. I, I mean, you have Hack RF and you have Lime and like Lime SDR. And it's just like, yeah, I'd, I, you know, I've been in this market for a long time and even five or 10 years ago, you're looking at something might be twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to work on. It, right now we use Epic SDRs, but it, you could just use Lime SDR for a couple hundred dollars and get yep. started. It's pretty absurd what you can do because you can, yep. beyond like the owned waveforms, right? And the specialized stuff, it's really not that hard. You literally can watch YouTube and build your own specialized, you know, radio network for uh, under a thousand dollars and a weekend of time. So, and so we, when I came back from that experience, like, holy crap, we need to outpace the hobbyists. Like, you know, obviously, uh, the war is adding significant urgency to people learning this stuff. I could talk all day about how we need to, to do that as well internally and be learning from all these things and just feed on that urgency. So we are prepared, but yeah, it was like, that's the utility of, of the internet these days. Like you can get really quickly up to speed on some pretty complicated technologies, which are actually made less complicated by, you know, things like GNU Radio, which is all open source. And so it was incredible. And so it's just like it something that I had known that our teams should be learning how to do. And I'm a big open source fan. And then, uh, then I get punched in the face with it with these guys in Kiev. I was like, yeah, this is the world that we live in now. Things can evolve at the speed of days and not years. To even expand that a little bit more, the benefits of using some of those platforms, you think taking that concept of Arduino Raspberry Pi and extending that across like all the electronics that we use. It's not particularly that, hey, there's a blue supply chain, secure supply chain for XYZ component. It's I need for people to understand that this capability exists and I need to educate as quickly as possible. So the documentation in the community that's around open source intelligence or all of the peripheral tools that are around pen testing now or the C5 ISR applications of those tools, because there's YouTube about it, because there's open source, we can train somebody up or they can learn really, really quickly. Whereas, yeah, five years ago and certainly 10 years ago, that was all like nobody knew anything realistically. It makes changing capabilities and looking at rapidly changing missions like we're seeing in Ukraine much more accessible, I think. So it's what I really respect about what Building Momentum is doing because there's such an open problem in the market. Just educating people, like, hey, you know, Harris Radio, it has its place. But we all know that there's, uh, there's probably two extra zeros on top of it of what you need to use for a lot of the applications that you have. So let me show you what you can do with this 
$15 board and a Raspberry Pi. If you really want to send data, like, let me show you what this little sensor package in LoRaWAN can do. You know, you can build a mesh network for like 200 bucks and you can deploy it however you want. And when you're done with it, just throw it in the trash. <laughs> you know what I mean? So very interesting time we live in. Speaking my language. I love that. I mean, and I love that you know a lot of these things too. So we can nerd out later about some of that. I think that's, if I was to like a uh, future cast, that speed is going to be the greatest weapon that we will ever use in any type of conflict here on out. And you, to your Harris radio concept, you're right. There's a time and place for for those types of platforms. But if they get compromised, which, you know, given the fact that things like ChatGPT uh, are moving at such paces like decrypting some of these things and sort of getting into the loops of those will become easier and easier as well. So at some point, you can't take five years to build a new platform. You're going to have to build it. It's going to you're going to have to know that it lasts a month and then you're going to chuck it in the trash and move on. What I found is that it's the confidence to know you can do it. So that's I mean, think about you and I, for example, I have a chemistry background. I'm not sure what your educational background is, but you know all this stuff. I can just I can hear it in your in your description, you probably know how to program an Arduino. You probably have messed around with Raspberry Pi. You probably know these things. But what? how do you know these things? How do you know that you can know the next thing? And it's this confidence that there is information in the world that I can ingest, and there's a piece of hardware here that I can touch, and I can make those things do something. I know I can do that. So how do you get to that point? Because that point is the seminal moment of this, like, some JSOC guys told me the other day that I'm the most dangerous person they know. Because I, I've played the soldier, I can do all the soldiering things, but I can do all the sort of the nerding things. And that's like, it's just a mindset. Before name some amount of years ago, I've never touched a Raspberry Pi. But I knew that I could use it, and I knew that I was like capable enough to dig into it, even though I had never touched Python. And sure enough, you know, after a couple of days, I was doing all sorts of crazy surveillance systems and image recognition stuff and things like that. It's not because I'm some genius, it's just because I have the confidence to know that I've been there and done that. So I think that type of understanding or confidence or whatever that is to grasp information in the world and grasp things and, and, and sort of amalgamate them into a thing and then doing that fast. Those two things will outpace a lot of our adversaries out there. If you think about like China, for instance, which everyone loves to think about, they're more of a monolith. They're more like Russia. They have this bureaucratic monolith of a military and and they will never be able to keep up with a very agile sort of community industry driven force that is just pivoting constantly. It's just like a scurrying mouse of information. So yeah, I f we firmly believe in that. I firmly believe in, the, in providing people with that confidence and then using speed as like the other lever. 100% agree about the speed thing. Is Really, that's the power of these prototype solutions, right? To be able to just get some confidence around that we understand what the problem solution fit would be, what what types of technology to approach. Like just diving in gives us a lot of confidence over time. It's like I have solved similarly difficult problems and we can never really get there unless we have undeserved arrogance, right? We can't really get there without experience. And so participating with someone like yourself is really how we get there. I see just a really burning need for this at volume. So I'd like to just wrap this up and make sure that everyone knows how to get involved with what you're doing with building momentum. Like I said, we have a lot of friends in common. So if they're listening to this show, how do they reach out and say, this would be really great for my unit. This is really something that we should bring into our division as a program. How do they get in contact with you and maybe poke around at what they could bring in capability capacity to pull innovation into what they do day in, day out? Yeah. So in that space, we have two kind of primary offerings and that I'm just going to, for lack of a better term, call it like MacGyver school. We call it innovation boot camp. We can go to places. So if we blow into Qatar or Japan or Australia, um, we bring pallets of gear because every student gets a 3D printer and every student gets a whole box of tech sensors, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, things like that. Because I feel strongly that if, if you're going to play with it at home, you're going to be so much more capable in the field. So we give that to you. We go to places and we also have that here in Alexandria. We do something called Innovation Bootcamp by the Seat. So like today, we have uh, a bunch of different services training together that would normally never touch, you know, spend time together. They're just orthogonal sometimes in operational space. And that's fun because you could be with a SEAL team uh, member. You could be then next to an FBI person or next to a Space Force person. We train all these groups and uh, there's so much goodness that happens there too. And those are... So those training sessions are usually a week long. 
They're really intense. You're going to learn more than you've ever learned in a college class about all these different things, about 3D printing and coding and mechatronics. And you build a robot and you might build a GPS tracker. You're going to use chat GPT to write code, all these things. It's really intense, but it's a lot of fun. And then we do advanced sessions. After you've had that sort of foundational session, we do advanced sessions on build your own drone from scratch, build a whole clandestine surveillance kit from scratch. And so we do those types of things. So if you're interested in any of that, uh, you can go to our website at buildmo.com, B-U-I-L-D-M-O.com. Or you can get a hold of me through info. Just hit info at buildmo.com and ask whatever questions and that'll get filtered to me. And, uh, and then we can, we can do, uh, we can do some crazy things. I love the custom stuff. I want to build a CubeSat that, uh, you know, that puts, uh, Skittles over, uh, you know, over Australia every month or something. Like I would love to do some crazy projects like that too. And we train on some of that weird stuff too. So there's something, uh, something out there that's interesting, you know, give us a yell. Brad, thank you so much for your time and thank you for being on the show. Really appreciate it. This has been awesome. We got to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Callie Keen, and this has been the Startup Defense.